Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, forum. In the name of the Safe Seas Network and the Stable Seas Program, I like to welcome you all to this event here today on piracy data. My name is uh, Christian Büger. I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen and also one of the co-directors of the Safe Seas Network. And I will chair today's event. We titled this forum, do we have the right data for fighting maritime piracy? And this is precisely the question we would like to explore today with our panelists. Before we move to uh, our speaker and panelists, allow me to quickly introduce you to the topic and tell you also a little bit about the background of today's forum. Why does piracy data matter? Now, Piracy attacks continue to be rampant and threaten the shipping industry. In the Gulf of Guinea and other regions, attacks continue despite substantial international efforts, as well as self-protective measures. Good policy and effective responses uh, depend on solid data. The right data allows us to identify patterns, criminal networks, but also target interventions better and also provide us with clues what measures actually work and which ones not. So data is actually quite uh, important. Piracy data has been systematically collected actually already since the 1980s. And back then it was initially the International Maritime Bureau and the International Maritime Organization. But since the 2000s, roughly, the number of actors and organizations who are collecting data on piracy has substantially increased. It is now regional organizations, but also maritime domain awareness centers which collect such data for particular regions, but also in support of military operations. Now, this has implied that over the years, different definitions of what should count as piracy and what information should be included in the data sets have, have been developed. And because of that, data is often fragmented and reports also tend to come to different conclusions, in particular if it concerns trends and patterns. This quite obviously is problematic to a certain degree. And it raises the question of whether and how this data actually could be harmonized. We also need to uh, ask the question whether the data that is currently collected actually meets the needs of all of the users. Are law enforcement agencies, the shipping industry, security anal analysts, but also academics, are they getting the right information, the data that they need, and also the right picture of the situation at sea? And I'm delighted uh, that we have today representatives of exactly these groups in the panel to add their perspectives and opinions on these questions. And as a very quick uh, background to our discussion here today, in the backdrop is a report titled What We Know About Piracy. And this provides a systematic overview of how data on piracy is collected. It is part of a joint collaboration between the Safe Seas and the Stable Seas program and was authored by Ludel Joubert from whom we are gonna hear in a second. Now, the report is part actually of a series of papers of the Transnational Organized Crime at Sea project, which is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK. And in this project, uh, a wider team actually aims at collecting systematic evidence on what we call blue crimes, including piracy, quite obviously, but also smuggling and environmental crimes. If you would like to know more about uh, the Transnational Organized Crimes at Sea project, I would like to invite you to visit our website, uh, which is safeseas.net. And at that address, safeseas.net, you will find today's paper, but also other important information on blue crimes more generally. 
to tackle blue crimes, we require good data. And this is why our discussion here today is so important. Now, a little bit on housekeeping today's session. Before I give uh, the word to the author of the report, uh, Ludel Joubert, uh, I would like to introduce you briefly to how we're going to proceed today. Ludel will speak for about 10 minutes, introduce you to the report. I will then invite our panelists for their short statements of about five minutes, short and crispy. Afterwards, we will open up and all of you will have the opportunity to ask questions. To do this, please do use the Q&A box, type in your questions there. And when asking a question, please also shortly mention your name, your affiliation, and tell us whether the question is more general or whether it's particularly targeted to a distinct speaker. Now, briefly to introduce uh, Ludel, Ludel Joubert is certainly known to the majority of us, I, I, I would say, as one of the most distinguished and important independent analysts on piracy around the world. And she has recently uh, joined uh, Stable Seas, in particular to work on the very well known The Costs of Piracy report, one of the most important uh, data sources on piracy, but also on the emerging and increasingly important Maritime Security Index. I very much look forward uh, to Lidel's uh, summary of the report. And over to you, Lidel. Floor is all yours. And thank you for uh, all for this opportunity to share the report. What we know about piracy. The beginning of the 20th century saw a decline in piracy incidents globally, but this relative uh, at the time of few incidents was short lived. By the 1970s, piracy was on the increase again. A maritime piracy and armed robbery of ships became problematic by the 1980s. Of more and more of 150 incidents was reported in that year. The systematic recording of incidents by the International Maritime Organization and the Mar International Maritime Bureau started in the 1980s. Um, an all time high in piracy was recorded in the year 2000, with 469 incidents reported worldwide. Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, South America, West Africa, and Somalia all reported high numbers in that year. Now, the, the paper, What We Know About Piracy, provides the first systematic overview of how data on piracy and armed robbery is collected and what different kinds of information on piracy are available. The paper addresses how different organizations define, categorize, quantify, and analyze piracy. What common themes and issues can we identify? Who collects this data and how? How accessible is the data? And where's our blind spots? Uh, first, providing the overview is important in order for us to get a better understanding from the, of the gaps in the data. Um, second, it allows stakeholders to identify divergences in data analysis and a better understanding of the reasons there are potentially conflicting numbers and trends. In addition, such an overview constitutes a first step towards harmonizing data to inform responses to piracy and strengthening overall analytical capabilities for maritime security. Now, who collects data on maritime piracy and armed robbery against ships? With the increase in piracy incidents in different maritime regions since the 1990s, the number of actors collecting data and analyzing these incidents has grown substantially. Data and, and analysis are now available from piracy reporting centers, international and regional organizations such as diffusion centers, naval services, 
the shipping industry, maritime media, and the wider expert community. Some international organizations collect data, uh, inc the incidents itself on piracy and armed robberies of ship, while data on pirate networks and individuals in these networks, including biometric data, is collected by others. And there's overall an underlining commonality and understanding in the classification of data and themes and data by different organizations. This also indicates that there's a high level of information sharing between organizations. Information flows, who is reporting these incidents and what data is collected by organizations. Different organizations collected data, of course, for different purposes. Um, while some will collect it um, and classify uh, data, um, the interest of every party will determine what, uh, what are collected. Some international organizations will collect data to support policy makers and decision makers, while other data is collected to get a better understanding of threats in the maritime domain, on support of risk assessment to serve clients, such as for security companies. Topologies are used to create a better understanding of the nature of piracy and robbery against vessels. All reports use the same standard fields, like the name of the vessel, the type of vessel, the place where the, where the incident was reported. Um, the differences came when we start looking at um, the classifications of data and type of the type of attacks and the level of violence during attacks. Um, usually organizations define um, these classifications in the report to get a better understanding. The International Maritime Organization recommends a specific procedure for reporting piracy and armed robbery. It's recommended that the rescue coordination centers in the coastal state um, or the regional uh, um, um, centers which is in the first point for reporting, should forward all reports of piracy and armed robbery to the IMO, the IMB, or RICO. Most of these international and regional reporting organizations also offer a 24 service um, for shipmasters to report piracy and armed robbery incidents. In reality, of course, um, not everyone will follow the specific um, um, reporting procedures in the case of an emergency. And the crew and the master will do whatever uh, deem effective to get immediate assistance in case of an emergency. Um, most, uh, today, most vessels also carry satellite phones. And in the event of attack, a potential, or a, a potential attack, the master or ship security officer will call the company security officer or international or regional reporting organizations directly. Quantifying and analyzing maritime piracy and armed robbery. Not all data fields can be quantifiable, but some fields are extremely useful in identifying patterns. Simply quantifying data is also not in, uh, enough. Incidents should be analyzed in terms of how they influence and relate to each other. The names of the vessel, type of vessel, time of attack, the location, all give us a certain pattern over time. Certain vessel attributes such as maxim maximum speed, freeboard, constructions and schedule, as well as time of day and area of operations, make a vessel more vulnerable to attack. In certain areas, certain ships are more likely to be targeted because of the cargo they carry. Sea state also affects the likelihood of success of an attack. Patterns of lies life and fishing vessel activity are used to determine what a typical pattern of ship movement will look like and whether there's a deviation from normal patterns. Analysis of these attributes can be used to Im implement anti-piracy measures to protect vessels against attacks, such as those contained in the best management practices. Here we think of BMP-5 and BMP West Africa. Naval forces also use analysis to support command decisions, to address the challenges of covering a large area of operations with limited naval forces, for instance, 
analysts that are combined maritime forces operating in the Western Indian Ocean use spatial analysis of piracy attacks, predictive models to forecast piracy risk based on past attacks, maritime traffic patterns and weather patterns to calculate the recommended patrol area size per asset. Differentiation problems, limitations and blind spots. Quantitative analysis of piracy has limitations. Rather than basing analysis exclusively on figures, a deep understanding of what these number represent and what shifts and changes are taking place is required. Some organizations will not report coastal incidents out of fear that doing so will inflate figures. As these incidents do not often impact commercial shipping, the risk is seen as not applicable to commercial vessels and reports are often compiled from the viewpoint of commercial companies. Where these incidents were not reported previously and are then reported, we see um, uh, uh, in, um, a spike in statistics that's not always representative of the situation. Uh, currently, we can see this happening in Mexico with uh, attacks on offshore uh, security vessels um, being reported now, but it's actually been going on for years. Problems not only exist of what constitutes piracy and armed robbery, but also around the willingness of countries to report incidents due to sensitivity about territorial sovereignty. For this reason, many countries are reluctant to report security incidents in the territorial waters, while they have no problem reporting safety-relating um, incidents. Underreporting of piracy problems has always been a concern. Not all masters of vessels will report incidents. High-risk countries will not always report because they don't want their country to be classified as high-risk. Underreporting is especially problematic in certain categories of vessels, such as small coastal tankers and fishing vessels. The term piracy is also used to describe a wider spectrum of maritime crime. Related activities such as illegal fishing, bunkering, oil bunkering, oil smuggling, attacks on oil rigs um, are all labeled as piracy from time to time. Incidents can also be misinterpreted as piracy when in fact they're related to drugs, fishing or smuggling activity. Some organizations and companies also add these non-piracy related incidents in piracy data sets, which uh, result in elevated numbers in statistics. It's important for organizations to have a list of definitions of their criteria so researchers and analysts can interpret the data correctly. Information on piracy networks are lacking in many areas involved. In conclusion, today piracy is well researched and well documented. At least two thirds of available incidents information can be derived from data from piracy reporting organizations. Incidents reported by these organizations are well analyzed and verified by member states. Maritime security companies, maritime insurers, shipping companies, company security officers, and port officials are all valuable sources of information. Analysis of piracy data can contribute to better domain awareness and a predictive capability um, over time. Um, however, this predictive capability will be limited as long as essential elements of information such as detailed knowledge of pirate networks are lacking, and as long as the understanding of incidents in territorial waters and the classification problems persist in reporting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lidel. And if you want to read the full report, I like to invite you to visit either the stableseas.org uh, website or the safe seas dot net website. I'm now delighted to welcome our panelists uh, for today and allow me to briefly introduce them. Cyrus Modi, our next speaker, he's the Assistant Director at the International Chamber of Commerce's Commercial Crime Services, where he's in charge, uh, among other things, for one of the most important 
piracy data providers. That is the International Maritime Bureau's piracy reporting center. And that center has really been core and at the forefront uh, of piracy data collection since the 1980s and also in organizing uh, responses to it. We will then hear from Siri Bune, who uh, works for the Global Maritime Crime Program of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC. And she will add our law enforcement and also capacity building perspective. And I'm pretty sure you're all aware of the great work of UNODC and the GMCP in particular in this area. Next up is uh, Jakob Larsen, who is uh, also here from Denmark. And he's the head of maritime uh, safety and security at BIMCO, one of the major uh, international shipping associations in the world. And he will address the question from the perspective of the shipping industry. Last but certainly not least, we will hear from uh, Dr. Ursula Daxecker, who is from the University of Amsterdam. And she's one of the globally leading academic analysts uh, drawing on piracy data. So I look forward to her take on what kind of data we need. I'll give the word to the panelists uh, in this order and I look forward to your brief five minutes opening statements. Cyrus, the floor is all yours. it'll help if I switch on my mic. Okay, um, thank you, Christian, for the introduction. And good morning to everyone who's joined us. And thank you very much for, for um, coming in for, for this quite, quite an, it seems like it's a very important um, topic to discuss. Before I start, um, I would like to thank the Safe Seas Program of the University of Bristol and Copenhagen and the Stable Seas Program of the One Earth Future Foundation for compiling and releasing this report. The IMB Piracy Reporting Center has been in operation um, since um, a, a very long time, since 1991. It is the only non-governmental and non-commercial center of its kind in the world, providing shipmasters and ship owners the option to report any incident of piracy or armed robbery occurring anywhere in the world to one single point of contact. The aim of the center has always been to ensure the report received is immediately relayed to the nearest and most appropriate response agency. If the incident is ongoing, the center will liaise with the authorities and request assistance. And it will keep the ship and its owners and operators updated at all times of this assistance. This sort of assistance will continue till the vessel is deemed to be out of harm. In parallel, the center also broadcasts messages via the GMDSS safety network service to alert all ships in the vicinity. The center also sends email alerts to industry CSOs and superintendents as well as naval and law enforcement agencies, which allows them to get a better understanding of the threat on the water. Information on all incidences reported to our center are forwarded to the International Maritime Organization, which we believe is the apex authority for all maritime safety and security related issues. The transparent information exchange carried out by the IMB has over the years aided many stakeholders within industry and government make informed decisions on risk and allocation of resources to overcome risk. The IMB very much looks at this crime from a seafarer's perspective. As a seafarer myself, I can confidently say that any incident near or on a ship 
can be equated to an incident near or on our individual homes. While the definitions of this crime of piracy or armed robbery are vital to understand where the crime occurs and who can or should be responsible to address it, from a seafarer's perspective, especially when under attack or being fired upon, taken hostage, injured or kidnapped, remains irrelevant. Different agencies and organizations report this crime differently. And the report which has been removed also has stated this. But there is nothing wrong in that, provided it is always appreciated and acknowledged that the crime has occurred. And that the crime, however petty it may be, or wherever it may have taken place, be it on the high seas, or in territorial waters, or in an anchorage, or at a berth, could have had the potential of injuring or killing a seafarer. From the IMB's perspective, all meaningful response starts with meaningful statistics and information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cyrus. Uh, Ziri, over to you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Christian. And a big thank you to Safe Seas and Stable Seas for inviting you in ODC and the Global Maritime Crime Program to speak at this event. As probably most of the audience know, the Global Maritime Crime Program is involved in supporting member states in tackling maritime crime, including piracy, through capacity building in maritime law enforcement and piracy prosecution support. Therefore, keeping accurate and up-to-date data on the current piracy situation is important to ensure a proper response. And in this regard, the Global Maritime Crime Program has strengthened its research and reporting component over the years and has the following initiatives. Specifically, we have a close cooperation with the Stable Seas, who is one of the hosts today, in producing regional maritime crime threat assessments. And we recently launched a Gulf of Guinea report, and we're soon to launch a Caribbean report. Previously, we have done a Bay of Bengal report and a Pacific Ocean report. And we are in discussions to look into an Indian Ocean West report. Also for the last two years, GMCP has been supporting Stable Seas in continuing the mentioned State of Piracy Annual Report. This is because the UNODC keep referring to figures in this annual report and see the value of continuing the, this report. Further, GMCP has cooperated with Denmark in developing studies on piracy in Horn of Africa and the Gulf of Guinea. And the latter report is actually now looking at expanding the focus to look at the organized crime element behind piracy. Further, it's worth mentioning that GMCP also produces separate ad hoc thematic reports to specific maritime crime areas under the Indian Ocean Forum on Maritime Crime. This is not specific to piracy, but the broader maritime crime, including heroin trafficking, illicit trade in goods from Somalia in response to UN Security Council resolutions, the Law Enforcement Task Force and the Prosecutors Network. As GMCP works directly with member states in providing technical assistance, a lot of our work is based on information on the piracy situation received from national maritime law enforcement entities, prosecution authorities, and the judiciary. Additional information is received through work with regional organizations, representatives from the industry, and open source information, including media. Specifically for the Gulf of Guinea region, we're currently re working with a representative from the industry who's collecting open source information, analyzing the trends and sharing and distributing this with relevant maritime partners. GMCP capacity building in tackling piracy has been mainly focused on Africa, 
including the Horn of Africa and the Gulf of Guinea, but to a lesser degree in other regions where the focus and priority has been on other maritime crime threats. Specifically to the Horn of Africa, GMCP has been supporting piracy prosecution centers since 2009, including Kenya, Mauritius, and the Seychelles. At the piracy peak in this region, GMCP contributed to a common database, including personal information about the suspects. In addition, GMCP facilitated case record keeping through a spreadsheet highlighting acquitted, convicted, transferred, and repatriated cases. By the years 2016 and 17, most of these piracy prosecution cases were concluded in Eastern Africa. It is very worth mentioning that in parallel to this UNODC uh, database, Interpol kept a database uh, including fingerprints from pirates on vessels hijacked and released, which has been a vital, uh, which, which has been vital in identifying former pirates. Today, we all acknowledge that the piracy epicenter is in the Gulf of Guinea region, and GMCP is supporting member states in this region developing counter-piracy legislation. There has been an upsurge in attacks lately, with the exception of last week, and several ongoing kidnapping negotiations in this region. The trend shows an increased number of attacks outside of Nigerian waters and a further spread in the region. The challenge, though, is the lack of piracy prosecutions in the Gulf of Guinea. Though it's worth mentioning the ongoing case in Togo, Dona 1, as well as the recent arrest of 10 suspected pirates under the Keilongfeng 11 case awaiting prosecution in Nigeria. GMCP stands ready to support both Nigeria and other countries in the region in prosecuting piracy and ensuring that there's no impunity for piracy. Specifically with regard to reporting in the Gulf of Guinea region, the whole Yaonde architecture should be acknowledged. And the ICC, who regularly updates on, maritime crime, on the maritime crime situation in the region and sharing this with relevant maritime stakeholders. Specific to this report, what we know about piracy, uh, it's mentioned UNODC's sharing of electronic resources and laws on crime, the so-called Sherlock platform, including different sections on specific crimes, including piracy, and this on piracy section has been updated to maritime crime broader. It contains maritime crime case law and legislation. It further, though, requires either member states or UNODC to populate this section with resources, and GMCP is currently at the stage of updating this. I would further like to mention that GMCP is working on supporting member states in strengthening the maritime domain awareness. By doing so with the use of technology and providing MDA analysis training. This is also an important contributor to ensure an accurate picture of the maritime crime situation. So these are some of the GMCP initiatives contributing to piracy data and reporting. I do, re I do support this report's focus and emphasizes on the importance of having accurate and consistent figures on the piracy situation, especially now that we see more and more actors involved in data collection and reporting. And this applies also to the definition of piracy and the different categories of attack. I would further encourage to, fo to focus on some of the root causes to piracy and understanding the organized criminal networks behind the crime, which is an area that GMCP is currently looking into. I thank you for the report and for letting you know this speak at this event. Over to Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Siri, and in particular also stressing the importance of uh, other blue crimes uh, than piracy here. But here we're talking about uh, piracy primarily, of course. Next up is uh, Jacob. Floor is yours. Many thanks indeed, Christian, and uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity here to speak at this uh, webinar, which I think poses a, a very relevant question. Uh, the question is, do we have the right data for, for fighting uh, piracy? 
<clears throat> I've listened uh, with some interest to um, to what the uh, previous uh, panelists had to say, and and I must say that uh, to a certain uh, degree, I'm not sure I, I fully agree with what has been said. Um, I don't think that there is uh, so many uh, problems right now with uh, neither the, the volume of data and all the quality of the data that we need uh, to fight piracy. And actually, I would argue that uh, never before have we had uh, so much uh, high quality data uh, for law enforcement agencies to go out and uh, do the necessary to, to combat piracy. Um, let me try to, to expand a little bit on that. Um, First, I want to um, address uh, a point that has been uh, highlighted also by some of the previous presenters, and that is the, the under-reporting or inaccuracy of reporting of piracy incidents uh, from the shipping industry. I, there may be some differences in, in the reports coming from, from companies, and I also admit that uh, perhaps occasionally some reports are late, but, but I have to say that uh, normally, uh, shipping companies and, and ships that are subjected to attack, they report very quickly in terms of a distress message and in terms of uh, pressing the uh, ship security alert system, thereby alerting the flag state and the company security officer, uh, who would then in turn normally uh, uh, warn the, uh, the relevant reporting center. And uh, for the current piracy hotspot, which is the Gulf of Guinea, the reporting center is uh, in that gog. So this would be the normal uh, sequence of events, uh, and that would lead to law enforcement agencies having the necessary in uh, information to, uh, to initiate a response uh, very quickly. Uh, I have talked to MDAT-GOG uh, on many occasions and asked them whether they receive these reports, and uh, they confirm that they do receive these, and they also pass them on to the law enforcement agencies in the region. So, so apparently the data is available for law enforcement agencies and, and navies to act on. Um, moving on to the question of, of the quality of information and do we have the right information and, and thank you very much Lydell for the, the report. Uh, it was an interesting read and I noted that there was a, uh, an overview of exactly which uh, data sets uh, were uh, included in the uh, different reporting formats and, and yes there are some inconsistencies. Um, and I think it is, first of all, it's a manageable issue and, and to a certain extent in terms of uh, combating piracy, I think it's also uh, quite a, a small issue to, to be uh, uh, quite honest. I think if you look at the information you can get from either a ship owner or a, a master who have been subjected to an attack, uh, the kind of information you would get is perhaps more of use uh, when it comes to incident response and perhaps not so, uh, not so important when it comes to uh, mapping uh, pirate kingpins, uh, identifying uh, the the, uh, the uh, more sort of strategic trends and so on. Uh, so uh, what the ship owner will normally be able to provide is uh, basic information about what kind of skiff uh, carried out the attack, how many perpetrators were there, uh, what kind of weapons did they use, and so on and so forth. And and um, these reports, they, they, they tend to be quite similar. And I would also argue that, for example, for Gulf of Guinea, we already have uh, a very accurate picture of uh, what is going on uh, from where these uh, attacks are being staged and, and so on and so forth. So, so the data is, is out there in plenty. What could be interesting is of course the, the, the more detailed information, for example, related to ransom payments, who receives the ransom. Um, and this is something that, that uh, BIMCO and other industry associations together with Nigerian authorities uh, are beginning to, to look into. Uh, obviously, data related to ransom payments uh, are sensitive. Um, some of it is related to insurance provisions, uh, which uh, are uh, dependent on a, on a non-disclosure agreement. So um, sometimes for commercial reasons, it's simply not possible to, to share the data. But it's something that, that uh, we are looking into. Um, let me bring you back to the, uh, the situation we saw in the 2000s when Somali piracy kicked off, because I think that is really a, a good case to show the potential of, of uh, information, what information can do and what information sharing and acting on information can actually achieve. Uh, back in the days, there was very little knowledge about what was going on in Somalia. The pirates, they were 
uh, operating from a, a legal vacuum. Uh, it was a completely failed state and actually among uh, many intelligence agencies there was little knowledge about what was going on in Somalia because there was so little uh, strategic interest associated with Somalia. But look what happened. Very quickly, uh, after uh, pirate arrests were being made, the intelligence services and the law enforcement agencies started to work together to exchange information through international associations like Interpol and Europol. And quite quickly, it was actually possible to map all the pirate networks. And, and we saw um, extensive uh, pirate network maps with uh, named and identified uh, pirate kingpins uh, almost down to uh, the, the geographical location uh, where they were living and, and, and this was information that was, was uh, shared uh, uh, quite uh, widely and so it just demonstrates the potential you have if you really commit wholeheartedly to first of all use the information uh, you get uh, if you respond to incidents and you actually arrest pirates that gives you the opportunity to interrogate these pirates and, and speak to them about who they are working for and, and how the, the whole uh, piracy uh, operation is set up. And in an area like uh, Gulf of Guinea right now, this dimension is, is almost completely lacking. Uh, it is correct that uh, around three weeks ago, we saw 10 pirates uh, arrested uh, who had uh, hijacked uh, a fishing vessel, a Chinese fishing vessel. and and. This was a, a fantastic uh, event that made me jump up and down with uh, enthusiasm. And I really hope that, that this will just be the, the first of a series. Uh, but what I fear is that it will be just another uh, drop in the ocean. I think, I think it has been a couple of years since we saw the last uh, arrest in, in uh, the Gulf of Guinea of, of pirates. Um, so in conclusion, I would argue to the question, do we have uh, the right data to combat piracy? I would say yes. We have very much uh, the right data. We have lots of it. Uh, what we really now need now is, is law enforcement agencies and navies um, working together to utilize that data uh, and then uh, start to do anti-piracy operations. And uh, no place is it more necessary now than in the Gulf of Guinea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacob, and in particular for highlighting the importance of law enforcement and actually using data uh, uh, as well. Ursula, over to you. Yes, hi, thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak here. Um, I will provide the academic, specifically a social scientific perspective on piracy and data. And what this means is that in my own work, I'm motivated by wanting to understand and explain why piracy happens, why it takes particular forms, and also what some of its consequences are. So in my work today, I would like to highlight three points. First, I'll talk briefly about how good the data are that we have, as some of the previous uh, panelists. Then I'll talk a little bit about, well, how can we improve the data that are already out there? And then I'll conclude also with some thoughts on what data might still be needed. So first, on the question of how good the data are that we already have, <clears throat> here I think I, I share somewhat the, the view of the previous speaker, Jacob Larson, that you know it's, it's difficult to study illegal behavior because when people engage in criminality, others don't want you to know about it. But if we compare piracy to other forms of crime, even other maritime crimes such as smuggling or IEU fishing, then actually the data that we have on piracy are much better in comparison. We have globally available data. We have that data for now many, many years, for several decades. So they're much better reported. Um, I mean, I also share the sense uh, expressed in the report that that doesn't mean we can just use whatever data are available uncritically. I do think it's important that we are critical consumers of the data. And to, be, to take on that position, I think it's helpful to ask ourselves what the incentives of the data producers are. So thinking about the question of, well, what's the purpose behind collecting the data, the people collecting the data, and does that purpose actually match what I would like to use the data for? And 
I think the report did a very nice job, and Vidal also in her presentation, in outlining, okay, what are the various goals and the various purposes for the organizations involved? And the purpose will be different for an organization that wants to tell seafarers and shipping companies and insurers, you know, about risk, whereas, you know, uh, someone who wants to, um, you know, engage, have international legal agreements that will reduce piracy will have different incentives. And so this, you know, is, is a debate that we often revisit that relates to the international legal definition of piracy, where it might be useful for someone who wants to make legal process uh, in reducing piracy to limit it to events that happen in international waters. But for me, as a social scientist who wants to understand why piracy happens, it doesn't make a lot of sense because it might even be the very same people, the very same perpetrators engaging in piracy internationally and in territorial waters in different occasions. But considering this question of incentives, I think is important. So moving on to the second um, point that I'd like to discuss, well, how can we improve the data that are already out there? Um, one um, aspect that I really appreciated in the report is this idea of a community of reporting that when there are incidents where there are, you know, questions that actually, you know, the data producers would be able to share confidentially information about incidents to be able to determine uh, what really happened. Another promising avenue for working with the data that we already have would be to integrate existing data. And, you know, if, if you've read the report, then you've seen that there are many organizations involved in collecting privacy data, maybe even too many. Um, but I think, you know, one helpful step here could be to try and triangulate and integrate these different data. And this is actually something that uh, Brandon Prince and I have done in our forthcoming book project on piracy, where we've systematically, systematically compared and combined data from the IMB, from the IMO, and also the US Office of Naval Intelligence, which has allowed us to prune some duplicate observations and also increase the overall number of incidents included. And a final suggestion on how we can improve the data that we already have would be to add some measures of uncertainty on incidents where we have questions about whether they are piracy proper or whether they might be something else. So Lidao mentioned uh, in her presentation that you know sometimes it can be really tricky. Is something fuel smuggling? Is it piracy? Perhaps simply adding an indicator that uh, that tells us whether we have doubts about an event could be useful for users. And this is something that has been done with other event data, such as the Global Terrorism Database. So this leads me to conclude, um, what data do we still need to understand piracy better? And this is also something that several of the other speakers have alluded to. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking now about data on piracy incidents, so pirates actually targeting ships. However, these incidents tell us fairly little about the identity of the pirates themselves. And this is an issue if we actually, you know, consider that for pirates to carry out attacks, they need land bases to operate. They also need to interact with local communities to maintain their operations. And so in order to be able to understand how they can survive on land, which also in consequence means, you know, understanding how they can carry out attacks, we actually do need better information on the pirates themselves. And from that perspective, I thought it was really fascinating to read about the Interpol database that apparently has information on thousands of suspected pirates. However, that database is not publicly available. Um, and so, you know, to get at this question of, okay, so what, you know, where are pirates located on land? You know, what do their organizations look like? How do they interact with the community? We're much more limited in the data that we have. We can look at arrests. Uh, reports, we can look at court cases, we can look at some interviews, we can look at first person accounts of people who have been kidnapped. Um, however, you know, that is much more feasible in some contexts than others. You know, in Indonesia, where pirates are regularly arrested, um, that might be a fruitful avenue. In other areas, you know, as, you know, the previous speakers also intimated, you know, there are no arrests really ever, or very rarely. So then, you know, this information is much more lacking. So there, I would actually suggest that, um, you know, qualitative research, uh, fieldwork interviews might be, might be a useful approach. However, you know, in the areas where we would need this information most, those are also the most difficult to, to carry out. So particularly in Nigeria, 
the Gulf of Guinea, you know, we also, you know that, you know, most of these pirates are actually, most of the attacks in the Gulf of Guinea are actually carried out by Nigerian pirates. Um, it's actually, it's, it's quite dangerous to do this work. So one possible avenue that I think would be fruitful here is to collaborate more with local, local experts. And so in some of the interviews that we've done with, you know, uh, people based in the Niger Delta, they suggested that one of the reasons for why there's so little reporting on piracy or criminality going on is that communities might not report because the state um, or the Nigerian military oftentimes, you know, responds in very retributive ways, so in very destructive ways. So they've destroyed entire villages after people had reported, uh, you know, criminals or militants in their vicinity. Um, so I think I have uh, used up all my time and my remarks here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ursula, in particular for putting it uh, into the question a little bit into perspective and comparing it to other uh, illegal or criminal behaviors as well as in perspective to terrorism data. We now have time for questions and answers. If you do have a question, please enter it in the Q&A box and I will then pick it up. And uh, I'd like you all, uh, uh, our panelists, uh, I'd like to invite you to just respond or raise your hand uh, if you want to respond. Um, the first question I would like to pick up uh, brings us back to the harmonization uh, question. So on the one side, there seems to be a case for more harm harmonization or even something like a global data set on piracy. So is there perhaps the case for uh, having a sort of clearing house on piracy, such as the IPCC for piracy prospectively under uh, UNODC auspices? Or are there different needs uh, of collecting piracy data so radically different that we need exactly the opposite, that the proliferation of data collection for different purposes is actually a good thing. And uh, of course, here the different purposes are uh, responses by the industry, early warnings uh, 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 for, the, for the industry, incident response, prosecution, but then also broader trend analysis. So I'm curious whether someone uh, from the panel wants to respond to this. Do we need one globally harmonized uh, data set in a clearinghouse, or are we better off in uh, appreciating the plural uh, setup of uh, different data collectors uh, because there are radically different purposes at stake? Who wants to pick up that question? Jacob. Many thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I think uh, one uh, global and harmonized standard is really a, a thing that could be extremely nice to have. But uh, that said, I don't think it's something that we need desperately to have. Uh, actually, the shipping industry associations have uh, done some work on this and have tried to, to pull together uh, different standards to, to, um, to uh, sort of formulate a, a single reporting format. Uh, and we presented this uh, to IMO uh, last year, and we were not particularly successful because, as it turned out, um, many uh, governments uh, felt that uh, they were actually better off using their own uh, standards. Uh, and so the initiative the industry had taken really, uh, really stranded on that. Uh, uh, we might just try again, but... but uh, uh, judging from from our prelim preliminary uh, results, um, it could be difficult to achieve one global standard. Uh, but that shouldn't uh, prevent anyone from from uh, carrying out the necessary law enforcement, because the data, uh, as was already pointed out, uh, is actually quite good. Uh, and uh, in today's day and age, actually in the big maritime newspapers, you can read about piracy attacks uh, just a few hours after they have occurred. So. I think never before in history has uh, piracy data been better and more accurate than what they are now. So I think it's time to uh, 
to roll up the sleeves for all the law enforcement agencies and the navies and they get to work. The data is fantastic. So global data set, long-term vision, but uh, actually we have the right data and uh, take it on. Someone else wants to respond to Lydia? Yes, I think there's some areas where we find problems. Like when we go in, for in the Gulf of Guinea, for instance, um, uh, there's several uh, locally operated uh, vessels where you don't find those incidents are reported. Uh, coastal tankers um, even in that area and um, kidnappings from fishing vessels there. Um, it's um, at times reported but not always. Um, and um, I think often it's also an indication of what's going on in the um, maritime you know, domain of, of these incidents, even if it's stored. For instance, in Somalia, we didn't see, um, even when, when attacks went down, we continue to see incidents on, on um, fishing dows. So I think then we have to look at those because it's indication that this is still um, happening and that hijacked vessel can be used as a mothership um, in future. So I think we need to look at uh, areas where commercial vessels, um, you know, is not involved, but wider than, than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question, which is di directly uh, connected and comes from Crimario2 and Gogin. And uh, that is the question whether there are actually at the moment uh, any kind of initiatives to have a sort of international open standard, some sort of open source uh, uh, mechanism for maritime piracy information sharing across uh, existing systems or, or, or future systems. Cyrus, perhaps you want to pick, pick this one up. Are you aware of any initiatives along these lines? Um, thank you, Christian. Um, I am personally not aware of any initiative which can, which is currently available for cross sharing of information. But like it has been alluded to by a lot of the other panelists, um, information is very openly available today on piracy. Um, we have a lot of information sharing centers, information fusion centers, which have been developed um, in the last 10 years. Uh, a lot of them on the back of Somali piracy. And these centers could potentially come together under one umbrella, possibly the IMO to become the single point of collective information sharing. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of these different centers, when they collect data and when they classify data, it is not done in a, in, in, in a, in a harmonized manner um, and hence, I guess definitions of one organization may vary from another, even though the incident is very, very similar. It can be even the same incident. Um, personally, I don't think that's too much of an issue because that is being done to satisfy the needs of that organization or the reporting agency or the collecting agency. And if we are to bring information together from various sources, then possibly at that single point at that apex, yes, um, people or different organizations need to sit down to agree on a set of definitions on how this crime can be categorized, defined, you know, slotted in. I mean, you can give whatever sort of label you want to it. Um, but I think that's going to be very, very difficult because there's, a, there's potentially a lot of politics behind that as well. And I think Jacob alluded to that very, very diplomatically um, when, he, when he intervened. Thank you. Thank you, Cyrus. Ursula, perhaps you also want to come in. I know that you have spent a lot of time in polishing these, these data sets. Are you aware of any kind of like open uh, 
standard for data formats or could academics perhaps pr provide such uh, formats? Yeah, I mean, I, I can come in very briefly. I mean, first of all, I want to say, I mean, I think we should be very grateful for people who do the hard work of doing the primary data collection. I, I, I haven't done original data collection on piracy, um, but I know how hard it is <laughs> to do original data collection. So I want to thank, you know, especially, you know, uh, the IMB, I think it's, it's a terrific public good that they're providing also by making these data, you know, so quickly and publicly available. Um, I do think that there is the potential, you know, for, for academics to try and, you know, take data from the IMB, which uses slightly different standards from some other organizations. Um, I mean, one of the things that we noticed when we try to integrate the IMB, the IMO data, which are almost identical, but sometimes, you know, there would be incidents where it's missing information on one indicator in one data set, but then it's provided in the other. So that, that was already helpful. Uh, the other aspect that was helpful is that when we added the, um, the U.S. Navy Na uh, Office of Naval Intelligence data, where I'm less certain, I mean, I'd love to hear from Liddell if she knows, I'm less certain how exactly their definition is different, but we did find that that allowed us to add quite a few incidents uh, specifically that happened in international waters. So, so I'm not in a great position to say, you know, whether those were questionable for qualifying as piracy, but that's one thing that we noticed that, you know, there were a lot more incidents in international waters. So I, 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 I definitely think that academics could, you know, could benefit from that. But, but then, you know, even if you combine existing data sources, it's still a lot of work to do that. And we did it for, for three data sets, but now in this report, I'm reading that there's 20 or more than 20 organizations collecting data. So then it becomes, yeah, very challenging quickly. Thank you for also flagging the, uh, the hard work that is uh, required indeed to uh, compile these data. I have a number of questions which concern uh, definitions and uh, Ursula, you were just mentioning also uh, attacks taking place in uh, international waters, which is the a definition, of course, of piracy under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. So the questions that I basically have uh, concerns, first of all, whether we do have the right definition for grasping the phenomenon uh, of piracy if we exclusively rely on uh, the definitions of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea as piracy occurring in international water. <clears throat> or whether we should actually broaden out our definitions, as I know uh, AIMB, for instance, does to incorporate also a territorial water incidents. So that that would be the first uh, uh, first dimension. And the second dimension then uh, uh, concerns how to define uh, an, a near incidence, an approach or an attempt, uh, uh, attempted mm -hmm. uh, piracy incident. So. Is that perhaps an area that uh, harmonization should focus on? And if, is it your opinion actually that this creates a particular kind of uh, problems in different trend analysis or interpretation of data or even in triggering uh, responses? Uh, who wants to uh, address that definitions on close? Lydia. Um. I would uh, like to think we need to find a way to uh, get some common grounds on suspicious approaches rep um, reported. That for me is a big problem. I mean, there's times where vessels reported suspicious approaches but, um, and, and seeing ladders, but it's so far off that I think it's, it's not really possible. So it will be um, interesting to know if we can can find a way to classify that i personally don't don't classify a suspicious approach to attack if there's not in fact um you know a, a physical contact of some sort i don't classify it as an attack but um for warning vessels in the vicinity that is extremely important um, even if it might not be um, a potential attack so around um, classifying that um, for me is a, is a big problem. There, there is um, certain analysts that will use any approach as an incident and it inflates um, figures. 
Can someone else, uh, Jacob? Yeah. Yeah, many thanks indeed. I think it's an area that needs uh, looking into um, for sure. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, the navies uh, can inspire us a little bit here. I know from, from mm. the Navy way of classification, uh, classifying contacts, uh, you operate with uh, different levels of certainty. Uh, so for a given contact can be an unknown, so you have no idea what it is, or it can be either a possible, a probable, or a certain um, specific category, for example, piracy vessel or uh, whatever it might be. Um, so that's one way of doing it. And to each of these uh, levels of, of certainty, you then you, you can then associate a number of, of different uh, uh, trademarks. So with an increasing number of, of uh, features uh, present uh, for the given contact, you can then um, classify it higher and higher. And for example, uh, a certain a pirate vessel would be a vessel that you have seen positively engaging in a pirate attack, for example, uh, whereas a probable uh, pirate uh, vessel could perhaps be a skiff uh, sided with uh, ladders on board, for example, or, or weapons on board. Uh, again, uh, these uh, different criteria you, you associate with the different um, uh, levels of certainty depends on, on uh, the pattern of life in the area. For example, in the Gulf of Aden, we know that fishermen often carry rifles. Uh, so, so a skiff with a rifle does not mm. make a, a probable uh, pirate skiff, for example, then it could be, for example, classified as a possible. And then if you have the latter as well, then it could be perhaps a probable. Uh, but I mean, these are discussions that will need to be taken. But I think if you set up a, a regime like that, uh, that is uh, probably something that could be um, could be um, used in, in the different um, in the different regions where uh, piracy have different uh, uh, different uh, expressions, if you like, or trademarks. Thank you, and, and this in turn uh, again would call for some sort of clearinghouse approach or mm -hmm. uh, international harmonization. I mean, one alternative to the uh, definition of uh, piracy in the, in the strict UNCLOS sense is, of course, to move a little bit towards uh, the terrain of the, of the Vienna Convention and uh, primarily understand it as a transnational organized uh, crime. Siri, do, do you want to come, come in on that? Uh, piracy better un, under the Vienna Con Convention or better under UNCLOS? Well, uh, I can see the value as mentioned by, by Jacob and, and Liddell to classify with the purpose of reporting, especially for what we are looking of reaching prosecution. I don't think we would want to change anything on the definition of piracy. We all know how long it took to negotiate the UNCLOS and that's what we are following with regard to, to the, the piracy definition. But I can understand that maybe some of the categorization um, on the attacks and, and sort of the blurred line uh, would be would be interesting. But um, I think the problem lies elsewhere and that's the response on any of this of quite clear attacks happening in, in the, on the water. So uh, if we can say uh, what Jacob mentioned with regard to law enforcement response and then get the prosecution, I think it's quite clear uh, on the definition. And as you know, UNODC is working on having domestication or having countries actually criminalizing piracy in line with UNCLOS. Um, we are not the secretariat to the UNCLOS, but we use it uh, quite a lot in our, our capacity building. Uh, on the Vienna um, Convention, the broader UNTOC uh, haven't really seen the need to, to broaden that scope. Um, we do it in other types of maritime crime, obviously, and especially on the Vienna Convention on, on Drugs. Um, but for the definition of piracy, I don't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, open the discussion of uh, changing that definition. Thank you. I have two similar questions, actually one coming from Ghana and one coming from uh, Tokyo, from, uh, from Japan, which both concern uh, the question of uh, reporting. So it's perhaps a, a question for Jacob uh, and Cyrus, uh, perhaps also for, for Siri. And uh, they are asking how can we actually uh, create better incentives, both for countries, but also uh, the industry to actually report incidents, but then also verify it. What's your opinion on this? 
perhaps I can I can start. Uh, I, I think it's um, it's an interesting question because actually I think the incentives are pretty good already. I mean, for for the the shipping industry to report, I mean that that would in turn lead to uh, improved security and and higher transparency uh, regarding these crimes and, and 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 as far as the coastal states are concerned and and, and reporting centers and so on for them, I mean it would simply help them accomplish uh, their mission and and for states in particular to to it would uh, you know facilitate the improvement of of, uh, of growth in the maritime uh, sector and the improvements in the blue, blue economy and so on so i think the incentives are pretty good um i think perhaps um it could be worthwhile to look at incentives that are, are pulling in the wrong direction and are in reality uh, sort of disincentivizing uh, reporting and, and and some countries and it's no secret that that uh, some west african countries are are suffering uh, quite a lot from uh, from corruption and so on uh, so um, there could be uh, unfortunate mechanisms uh, associated with that 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 could potentially be a, a disincentive for some to to report uh, and uh, i mean this is just a, a fact of life uh, and, and something that that they could potentially also be addressed and I realize that's not always very easy but uh, nonetheless I mean we, we need to um, to put all the issues up there if, if we were ever going to to solve uh, these problems so so um, that could be one to, to look into and I know that uh, a lot of governments in, in West Africa are already uh, doing a lot in terms of anti-corruption and so on so so I'm really glad that uh, that things are uh, on the right track but uh, I think it's also fair to say that there's some way to go yet. Cyrus. Thank you, Christian. Um, I think the, the, the there are reports which are coming in, um, no doubt. We, from from purely from an IMB's perspective, we, we, we tend to get reports which are done after the vessel sails out from a coastal state. And when we report it or when we relay it to the coastal state, we tend to come under a lot of flack from those coastal states as you know, why, why does the ship not report to us? And if they haven't reported to us, um, we don't consider this as an incident. And then there's a lot of doing and froing between us and the coastal states. Probably one of the concerns which masters may have um, to report directly to coastal states is the fact that by reporting, are they going to be getting themselves or their ships delayed in any manner? Because from a commercial perspective, that is an absolute disincentive to report. Um, I have had conversations with a few um, countries who will not be able to accept any report unless it is reported to their police and unless an FIR is lodged. Now, from a shipping perspective, that is sometimes extremely difficult to do. No agent is going to, however much they love the ship owner, they are not going to take it upon themselves to go to the police station and lodge a complaint on behalf of a master because then it is that agent who's going to get involved and it's going to be questioned and whose time is going to be wasted for the want of a better word. And this is more for the, the, the smaller or the, the, the crimes of um, theft and robbery which occur on board vessels. And it, the, the question which it may open up or the area of, um, uh, another entire area which may open up is will coastal states be agreeable for accepting a report let's say from the likes of the IMB or from the likes of the agent to take it as a report as as an incident having occurred while a vessel was in their port and I'm, I'm not quite sure if countries are going to be willing 
to take that step because it'll take a lot of time and effort in changing jurors to to changing the, the the sort of laws to allow that to happen. There are a lot of argue, um, counter arguments which we also get from Coast Guards and from other agencies, which basically tell us, and this is a quite quite a bit from the the Asian sector, which when we report, they, they blatantly disregard it and say that this is an act of crime which is being done by the ship's crew themselves. And when we sort of counter that and say, you know, we have a report and we don't seem to think that it is a ship's crew who has gone and sold it and uh, you know, for insurance reasons are claiming it to be an act of piracy or robbery. So I think these are, these are disincentives for the shipping industry. And if we can in some way try and make the reporting a lot more easier without too much of um, you know, comebacks from the coastal states on the masters, because we have to understand that crews are under a lot of stress when they are in port or whether in anchorages. And adding another layer of a legal layer on, on for, to a master is you're, you're, you're basically asking for a little too much from him. And maybe that's, that's the angle which we should be also sort of looking at. Thank you. Siri? I just think that's a, a very key um, element. Uh, creating that trust between the industry and the law enforcement response is necessary in order to ensure that there's a proper transparent response and there's a trust there and there's efficient and effective response with regard to not ensuring any unnecessary delay and unfortunately I think that's some of the problems with regard to some of the reporting. Thank you. I have a number of questions which concern uh, the gaps of our knowledge actually and that uh, concerns two uh, two issues. On the one side, it concerns areas uh, such as uh, the South Pacific, where there's not many uh, initiatives like this, or uh, a Maritime Domain Awareness Center uh, or something equivalent has not really been set up. Um, so this first concerns whether you think this is important uh, to set things like this up, even in areas where there might be prospective piracy given given the geography and so on, but such initiatives are not uh, uh, underway yet. And then uh, there's a number of related uh, uh, questions that ask whether we shouldn't try to include also land-based information into our piracy data sets or um, uh, embed uh, piracy data actually in larger uh, data sets on blue crime occurrences uh, at sea, correlating it to illegal fishing, smuggling, and uh, and so on. So I'm curious uh, uh, what you think about uh, these kind of questions. And to add a little bit uh, there, as part of the um, TOKAS project, we are trying to cover actually all f expressions of blue crime. So. Um, Stay tuned for uh, more papers and events coming up like this, which will also look into smuggling and uh, environmental crimes. And then hopefully towards the end, we will also get towards uh, the larger picture. But over, over to you, what, what do you think? Uh, should we make more efforts in this uh, direction and uh, clearly recognize the, uh, the land uh, dimension, the link to other uh, blue crimes, and then uh, also fill the gaps, uh, perhaps in areas where there's no piracy yet, but uh, there could be in the future. What do you think? Siri. With regard to um, linking up to the land, um, what's going on on land, I think that's very key in order to understand, and that's what I mentioned also in some of my uh, remarks. Um, trying to understand the networks, uh, what's going on at land, definitely an organized crime element to this. And if we understand the root causes, I think we also have a better understanding on the, the pattern and, and modus operandi at sea. Uh, also further to the links to other types of crime, UNDC is looking 
specifically uh, at uh, fisheries crime linked to, to drugs trafficking, uh, human trafficking, um, forced labor on board, uh, uh, fishing vessels, etc. So there's when you're talking about transnational organized crime, you're talking about a lot of linkages between different types of crime. And I think that uh, this is not uh, on piracy, that's not the an uh, exception there. So um, definitely land link. Um, then I've forgotten your last, the, the second part of your question, but the, the, at least my comment on, on whether to look at. The second part was uh, South Pacific, but um, who else wants? Jacob. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I agree entirely with uh, Siri that uh, you know the, the the link to what is going on uh, ashore is absolutely essential. Um, but I think also as as uh, uh, normal civil citizens and, and 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 perhaps those that are members of the, the academic community, uh, we also have to to realize that there, there are limits as to how much uh, detailed information we, we we can actually get there comes a point when 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 the really uh, valuable or really juicy information is something that will need to be provided by by law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies um, so so i think that's uh, that's just something that we have to accept and, and that said i mean we really need them to to engage um, much more eagerly uh, also for example in in the gulf of guinea um, for, for obvious reasons, I don't know uh, the level of engagement uh, of, of various intelligence agencies in that region, but looking at it from the distance, this is a region with uh, a lot of very um, strong geopolitical and economic interests uh, and a lot of uh, sort of global scale actors uh, concentrated in a very small area. So I would be very surprised if, if intelligence agencies uh, were not present in, in, in fairly um, uh, strong numbers. And so that, that only emphasizes my point again that there's probably some information out there that is, is not being fully utilized uh, for the common good. Uh, there may be reasons for that, I'm sure there is, but, but perhaps, um, you know, from time to time it's a good idea to pause and, and, and think again, can we somehow utilize available information and exchange uh, more and, and, and thereby uh, creating a more complete picture of what is going on which can then help us to, to carry out the necessary law enforcement. Uh, and again, I just repeat, uh, I mean, the best information you get is if you catch the criminals. And, and so far we have done moderately well, to put it very uh, positively for the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, there's a lot of piracy activity and very few criminals are being caught. So, so if we can step up uh, that, that part of it, I think we would do ourselves a big favor. To the, the question about uh, whether we should uh, begin to, uh, to concentrate on, on regions where perhaps uh, we don't see very much uh, criminal activity. Um, I mean, if, if there is no issue, then perhaps that's not where we should uh, spend a lot of energy. Uh, I suppose that uh, regional law enforcement agencies, they have an overview of what is going on in, in, in their region, uh, more or less. Um, uh, but and, and if we see uh, that that you know issues are beginning to crop up, uh, and recently we have seen some piracy activity in, in the Mexican Gulf, then perhaps it's time to to start to uh, to to follow developments a little bit more closely. But uh, but on the face of it, I think uh, there's plenty of of work to do for both law enforcement, uh, intelligence, and and uh, academic researchers in in some of the uh, the more sort of hotspots around the world. So. So on the face of it, I'm inclined to say that uh, let's focus on that and then, then leave, um, leave the other areas alone for a while until uh, it becomes necessary to, to look into it. Thanks. Ursula, do you yeah. perhaps want to come in on the question of prediction and future hot, hot spots, knowing that this is <laughs> one of your... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, well, I'm not sure it's it's so much about prediction, but I, I do think, you know, relating also to both of your questions, right, one on do we need to do more, uh, do we need more information about what happens on land and also links to other kinds of maritime crime. Um, you know, I've already made it clear that I do think it's, it's important to get better information on, you know, the networks behind, um, you know, especially the, the most serious attacks. But I also share the sense that that's always the most difficult because you know 
even if it was possible for the IMB to provide information where exactly the pirates came from, which I don't think you could. I think most of the time, you know, we might know that the Nigerian pirates because they speak English, but we wouldn't know <laughs> where their land bases are. But even if we could provide that information, I, I think, you know, that might be quite tricky from the perspective of, you know, the Nigerian government to do that um, because it would probably be quite embarrassing for them. So I think, you know, in the situations where it's, you know, maybe the most needed, it's also the most sensitive. And so what may happen is that it's, easiest or best if we can analyze this in more detail once the situation has actually improved, right? So we could look at, you know, what happened in Somalia, what worked in Somalia, and, you know, with Somalia, my concern would be that I think piracy there was very different from what's going on in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, but maybe we could also compare it to Indonesia, right? Were some of the measures taken there by the Indonesian government, which was much more capable than, than the Somali state, could we see if some of those lessons might apply in other situations? where it was much easier for us, for the research that we're doing, to actually speak to people who were affected by piracy and also to speak to former pirates. Um, I would still say that, you know, there are some important contextual differences in Nigeria, you know, the, the, the oil sector that is really the reason for why we, we see the shipping traffic and why we see the attacks, right? Indonesia doesn't have that, um, but, you know, that might be an avenue. And when we think about links to other crime, I mean, to other maritime crime, yeah, I think it's just going to be so much more difficult to get, you know, how, how would we collect systematically data on smuggling? And, you know, maybe for IEU fishing, I think some governments are, are making more progress in collecting information. I have a PhD student who works on Indonesia and who's actually using, you know, quite some information from the government. But even there, you know, there are huge incentives to report more on illegal, illegal foreign fish um, uh, theft rather than domestic Indonesian fishers who are engaging in illegal fishing as well. Um, I mean, the key question there, I think, is we, we do find, right, that, that different kinds of networks of criminality occur in the same places, but is it that they're caused by the same factors, by the same underlying conditions, or do they also diffuse, right? Do they in some ways infect each other? Well, in fact, it's kind of a problematic word here, but uh, I think that's that's a fascinating question that we don't have answers to, and I think it'd be great if your if your project can make some progress on that. Cyrus, do you want to come in on uh, on that as well? The IMB expanding its uh, its mandate. Um, Christian, yeah, um, expanding a mandate, I think that's going to be extremely extremely difficult because um and for, difficult from a point that information like like Ursula rightly pointed out, in, in information on the other crimes is extremely hard to get. And from my personal perspective, other crimes, it's, it's, it's more intelligence rather than information. And intelligence is more generated by government authorities or by um, specialized agencies and that is not shared with anybody um, so trying to create a, a much larger larger wider database of understanding if different crimes are connected um, is just going to be very very difficult especially from from a, from from a point of where it can be then shared with everybody like let's say if, you know if if imb does it um, so, so that is sort of one perspective. The the other is, this is all, this is all very very relevant from a law enforcement perspective. Um, to understand what's happening, where it's happening, what the linkages are, etc. And it is also great from an academic perspective because then, research allows us to understand what's happening and probably try and give solutions. But if you bring it back to the seafarer how is this going to actually benefit the seafarer? How is it going to benefit the seafarer by knowing that vessel XYZ in position wherever is actually a drug vessel or undergoing RUU? They will probably stay away from it, but at the same time, that vessel will also stay away 
because they have nothing to do with the with the seafarer it is a crime which is independent of the seafarer and and hence, even if you want to generate reporting, or if you want to use the eyes and ears of the of the seafarers and and the, the maritime industry, you know, trying to trying to send that information out to a ship and a shipmaster that look for X Y Z vessel because it's doing illegal fishing, it'll have to be very very specific. Not not a, a message saying you know in a hundred mile radius from point so and so look for a vessel which may be acting suspicious that is it's 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 worse than looking for a needle in a haystack and so it yes from from different perspectives from different um areas this information is probably needed um is relevant like law enforcement academics um governments understanding what's happening internally from a seafarer, particularly a seafarer's point, how much is it relevant? It's you know it's debatable. Plus, overload of information is also dangerous because then, when you start giving too much of information to a master, they will tend not to read the information, and that then causes more of a problem because relevant information gets missed. So I think there's a very fine balance on what information needs to be given to whom and for what purpose. Um, I, I don't think having a catch-all will, will work. And it's not only for this industry, it's, it's basically for any industry for that matter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for flagging this because uh, uh, too much information we're is also a problem, right? We're living in the age of too much information. Let me now uh, uh, give the word to Lidell and perhaps re to rephrase that question uh, a little bit. If you would write this fantastic report again in, let's say, 20 years, what do you think should be included in terms of what we know about piracy and how we collect data about it? Over to you. Um, I think I would like to see more uh, data um, on pirate networks and maybe more court cases. Um, there's plenty of, of information on court cases in, in, off the coast of Somalia, but uh, we don't have that data in, er in any other area. And actually, those court cases are very rich with information. Um, the, the Sherlock database, um, just looking at, at the Somali side, um, I've learned a lot from, from the court cases. Um, so I would actually like to see more on, on networks. And I mean, I always think um, piracy is connected with what's going on on land. I don't want to see the information in the same database though, but I always will go and see if I see a new trend, what caused this trend? And the answer is most of the time on land. But still, I don't want to inflate those database by adding everything. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's prospect for the uh, future. We are at the end of our uh, time. Thank you everyone uh, for this engaged discussion, also for, for the great uh, questions and contributions from the virtual floor. Stay tuned for more events like that. Uh, read the report. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, paper. And uh, during COVID times, I assume everyone has a little bit more time for reading. So um, that should be the opportunity. Visit the websites of Stable Sea and Safe Seas. And uh, watch out also for uh, future reports uh, we'll, in which we will be looking at different forms of blue crime and what we know about them. Big thank you to all of the panelists. And uh, unfortunately, we can only do this virtually. But let's give us everyone a round of real applause. Thank you. Thank you and bye bye. Very interesting. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.